Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We shall be talking about socialists, 19th century socialists of Europe today. Can we start with a working understanding of what socialists are, either of you? Goods and services in the economy using and central control of resources. Who is the center which controls it? The government. Okay. So they basically believe in nationalization of resources and their use. Okay. That's modern socialism. Um, socialism, uh, in an ideological sense, has been sort of up and about for a long time. Um, you could think in terms of Jesus as having been some kind of a socialist. You could think of Buddha as having been a socialist too. Can you? Can you think of them in what sense? That they believe that everyone should be given an equal share of the communities. Right. They were not socialists so much in the economic sense of the word, but they believed in the idea of equality of man in a metaphysical sense. Since people like Jesus or Buddha believed in the transitoriness of human life and its experience, they believed that everybody was equal in being victims of that which was simply transitory. You can't be a multimillionaire and be an exception to the law of things being transitory. So, in that sense, most religious communities have had a basic element of socialism in the sense that they considered themselves equal in the governance by fate. However, a lot of the socialism did not translate itself into material socialism as we see it in modern times. That is a big difference. It is true that early forms of belief systems, there is considerable idea of equality of people, not only in terms of uh, their being equally victims or for that matter subject to fate or destiny or whatever is the equivalent of the rules that govern spiritual and physical existence of people in a metaphysical sense, but also in terms of humility which was taught. Almost all great cults and religions at some point of time have taught humility as a big virtue. Humility is one of the biggest virtues of the Christians. Humility is a big virtue of the Buddhists and Jains. So, therefore, an attitude whereby you do not tend to let yourself become the center of your consciousness and to that extent consider that others are as much the same as you are. So, in this sense too, in this sense of an attitude in this sense of a posture towards life and towards others, a lot of religious communities, lot of religious cults have had a strong element of equality, egalitarianism in terms of value systems and in terms of virtues and beliefs. But this is not the socialism that we are talking of now, we are talking of more recent socialism either the 13th or 14th century, I am not very clear about it, 
the Jesuits started a, a socialist kind of republic in Peru. It was entirely run, controlled and organized totally by the Jesuit organization who constituted the government. It was a republic in the sense that it was not a monarchy and what is important is that it was totally tightly centrally controlled, managed, monitored much like a modern socialist economy would be, but somewhere around 13th or 14th century in Peru. An important issue is it lasted 100 years. That would probably be the first socialist experiment in modern times. As you can see, the fundamental motivating force that gets people into socialistic thinking is a reaction to capitalism and a reaction to the evils of private property. Not that private property is evil, John Locke said it was not and others too have said it was not, but they all admitted that it could have an evil dimension to it in the sense that it could be exploitative, it could be predatory. So, a lot of socialist thought has focused itself as a reaction to this aspect of capitalism and private property and that too in 19th century socialism not an exception at all. But before we go into that we should see the milieu in which I think I have said milieu wrongly L I U am I, am I right is something wrong with the smelling is it okay the milieu smelling check it out there is an I missing no it went for a vacation. Okay, so we will check that out. You see the industrial capitalism has its beginning in 1780 in England and grows rapidly through the end of the 18th century and grows very rapidly in the first 25 years all over Europe particularly France and Britain. Uh, in Britain very rapidly because Britain had the early start and France too. Germany was picking up by the 1840s. So, United States was picking up too. So, the first half of 19th century was a period of very rapidly growing industrial capitalism. There is no doubt about it. What is important is that in this period then the predominant social classes went through a transformation and therefore, also the conflict between classes. Do you recall that in Ricardo's writings and in Smith's writings, the predominant classes were the landowners and the capitalists. The workers too existed as a class in their writings, but somehow or other the conflict a the debate between Ricardo and Malthus for instance. Somehow or other the conflict seems to be essentially between landowners and the capitalists at that time. The workers trying to find some credibility, some space for themselves in the society were at that time found to be trying to manage between the two optional hegemonies of one the capitalist or the landowner. But in the first half of 19th century all of that changes. It is a period also of a strong strife between landowners and capitalists it is true, but it is a period which saw the rapid coming into power once and for all of the capitalists. This is also a period when the strife between the capitalists 
and the working class grows in intensity. There were frequent violent clashes in this period till finally there was a bloodbath in France when there was a civil war type situation where the working class rose in a revolutionary movement and was crushed in a big bloodbath in 1848. Beyond this point, ostensible or visible confrontation between the working class and the capitalists appear to disappear. And beyond this, the rule of capital seems to be the order of the day. Capitalism and the urban bourgeoisie constitute both the political and cultural dimensions of European society from here on. In the history of 19th century socialism too, you can think of 1850 as a benchmark. Up to that time, you had a variety of socialist ideas coming up having their own followers and having their own projects and so forth till by 1850 all of them seem to run out of steam but more importantly by about 1850 the emergence of marxism completely eclipses all other pre marxist socialist ideas Marx, as you knew, as you know, lived most of his life in England as an exile. And wrote in German, he never wrote in English. And I think the first translation of Marx outside German was somewhere in the 1870s, late 1870s, I think. Equally important. Marx reformulated the economics of Smith and Ricardo into their logical end, especially Ricardo. So, let us look at Marx after a little while before we finish to dealing with the earlier socialists who were popular in Europe. Why did people try to become socialist? Why did people try to become socialist? It was primarily a moral or an, or an ethical gesture. It was a reaction to capitalism from an aesthetic, from a moral and also from a political point of view. But the politics of early socialists did not have much economics to it, at least not the kind of economics which Marx was writing about much later. As I said, the moral stance against socialism was predominant. And this moral stance itself took two variants. Either you could think of people who were opposed to exploitation by capital and property. So, profiteering society based on the power of capital produced a moral reaction as a source of oppression, as a source of anarchy. The other moral preoccupation with socialism was with regard to the enslavement of workers. The enslavement of workers to a market which was controlled and dominated by capital. 
So, the bondage of workers to capital was a source of moral repugnance. Socialists thought along both terms. Those who thought about capital and profits were thinking in terms of a society where the power of capital would not be there and where institutions would be there which would displace the marketplace as a source of livelihood and as a source of allocation of resources. Most important people who thought this way thought of justice. For them preoccupation with socialism was mainly preoccupation with the idea of justice. Capital and profit meant injustice. So, dealing with capital and profit stringently meant justice to the people. On the other hand, the second type of reaction which is the response as an attempt to liberate workers from their bondage to the capitalists led to preoccupation with liberty, not so much justice. And a variety of socialist ideas were thrown up in this genre, some of them bordering on anarchy, some of them advocating that there should be neither private property nor the state, which is a classic anarchic position. So, you had this whole range. So, the first half of 19th century could be Europe also experimenting with all kinds of socialist ideas till they all ended up in the work of Marx in the second half. So, let us look at these early socialists, we will call them most of them utopians, so we will call them utopians. Saint Simon, Frenchman, was a kind of a mystic. He believed in the power of the people, but more importantly in the power of people with merit to run and manage society. Saint Simon thought that capitalism was immensely wasteful, immensely exploitative. So, he wanted to displace capitalism with a society run by a meritocracy. He said these people who run the society would be what he called the industrialists. They would be scholars, they would be scientists, they would be intellectuals, they would be entrepreneurs, they would be workers. In short, all of them people who spearheaded the modernity of Europe. So, these industrialists would be monitoring and running the economy and society. It would be an economy based on very high technology, high levels of investment and rapid economic growth. And interestingly, the running of this economy, the management of this economy would be in the hands of the capitalists. Although Saint Simo visualized the economy and society being freed from capitalists, he thought capitalists were the ones fit to manage this new social order. And how would they do it? Because they were the source of innovation in modern world. So, they were the ones who could think afresh, they could think creatively in the new society too. Saint Simonism, as I said, was a strongly personality oriented belief system. The followers of Saint Simon looked upon him as some kind of a messiah, and one of the greatest of the disciples of Saint Simon became the founder of modern sociology, Auguste Comte. 
Corinth actually built Sensimo up into almost a cult figure. So, what is the net outcome of Sensimo? There were lots of attempts at starting programs and projects which would transform the society socialistically, but nothing much happened. But what did happen was there grew a large number of followers of Sensimo across the world, particularly in United States, Canada, of course, also in France. And his influence as a thinker, as a, as a messianic figure, as a mystic became eventually more important than the programs and projects that he started. Charles Fourier, Fourier followed the opposite tack to Saint Simon. He was not a modernist as Saint Simon was. He was much more Rousseauian in his thinking. Does somebody have something to say about Rousseau? What was he saying? Can somebody tell me something about Rousseau in this class? Pani? Very good. Uh, he visualized the state of nature as one where uh, a community being out of, uh, being basically the out of individuals grouping in as a community and then uh, going around with the government. Uh, like simultaneously they would exchange their state of nature and is a noble savage. Yes, sir. The state of nature for Rousseau, uh, man is a noble savage. And uh, he is not immoral or lacking morals, he is just amoral. As in the, the idea of morality almost uh, does not exist. It's a later day creation. Hmm? It's a later day creation. Yeah, according to Rousseau. Mm. And uh, he says that uh, then he speaks about a general will. Mm. To the, his, con his social contact theory is, uh, relates to a general <coughs> will, mm. where uh, it is the general will of the people which should be taken as whatever. Mm -hmm. He also spoke about pleasure and pain mm. and, um, and the influence on morality. Um, I don't remember the details. Well, nice. That's quite a bit. Now, uh, we do not need to know much more about Rousseau than what you people have said, except that Rousseau was thinking as a man in a state of nature, as Aditi says, as a noble savage. True. Uh, savage because he was not covered by the trappings of quote unquote civilization and noble because he was free of the degenerative and corrupt influences of civilization. According to Rousseau, it is the coming into existence of society and its institutions which was the source of corruption of this noble savage. So, he was thinking in terms of the way out as a kind of a social contract among the members of society to liberate themselves from the perverse influence of society and following general will constitute a new social order based on social contract to which they surrender their freedom. What is interesting is to note that in both Hobbes and Rousseau, the idea was that you gain liberation from your own mediocrity by surrendering to a f your all your freedoms to a force superior to yourself. It is a complete sacrifice of freedom in order to be secure in both cases. Anyway, Charles Fourier shared Rousseau's ideas about the degenerative quality of society. In fact, Charles Fourier was completely opposed to the institution of family as a basic source of corruption, as a basis, basic source of degeneracy of human beings. So, 
One of the things he wanted banned in a socialistic world was that family as a core unit of corruption should be abolished. Women and men should deal with each other as individuals based on their free will and based on their shared commitments and so on and so forth and not at all be corrupted by the institution of family. On this score, it might be interesting for us to get a hundred years later than Fourier and see what happened in the Soviet Union after the revolution. Like Charles Fourier, early Soviet leaders after the revolution, 1920, 21, there was no belief in the institution of property family. Because the reasoning was family was the core unit of the society which led to the idea of property. And the idea of property became dominating over the human mind such that exploitation followed. So at that time the idea was that if you did not have families, you would completely cut off the possibility of emergence of the very idea of private property. So that socialist consciousness, equality of consciousness would spread. This was genuinely the belief in 1920, 21. So a lot of people lived together, a lot of people came together, they had children, but there was no marriage in the early mid 20s. What it did is not for us to consider because we do not know what happened, but what certainly it did was that it produced a certain amount of disillusionment because it was discovered by the 1930s that the family was a lot more than an institution of property. The family was an institution of security, psychological, emotional, physical. So the dissolution of the family as an institution did not create an alternative institution which provided that security, which provided that sense of comfort which family gave. So, in the 1950s, there was a lot of rethinking on all these things and it was accepted that it was not probably a wise thing to have abolished family in the 1920s. But that Soviet Union in the 1920s, we are talking now about Fourier and his times in France, but Fourier was very much in favor of abolition of the institution of family as the basic source of degeneracy in human life. Fourier was also thinking in terms of reorganization of industrial production into small workers communities, which would work on the basis of equal ownership, which would work on the basis of equal share of work and equal share of earnings. How popular Fourier was in the long run, it is difficult to say because by 1930, by 1830s, there were others who were becoming more popular. There were other issues in society which were becoming central. The person who was really significant after Saint Simon was Sismondi. Sismondi was an aggressive theoretician. He was not, not just a moralist as uh, Saint Simon was or for, as Fourier was, Sismondi was a, a theoretician of socialism. He was, he was a strong critique of Say's law. He was critical of Say's law because he said there would be no overproduction in society as long as the accounting identity which was aggregate demand equals aggregate supply could translate itself into a reality instead of being a virtual equilibrium. If it turned into a real equilibrium, it would be useful, but there was no way in which that real equilibrium could come about 
for the simple reason that society was unequal. It was divided strongly between capitalists and workers. So, where could you think in terms of a society without general overproduction? This is one point. The other thing, like many other socialists of his time, Sismondi was also preoccupied with the idea of underconsumption. Do you have any idea of what this theory of underconsumption was? We have seen it in Ricardo. Okay, if you didn't, it's fine. Basically, again, following from Ricardo, the argument goes that as the economy develops, the share of rent would go up. He was talking of corn loss. You remember, if corn loss continued, the share of rent in the national income would go up, and the share of profits would drop. But more importantly, the share of wages would drop too. So, Ricardo was of the opinion that the economy would be characterized by underconsumption, which means aggregate demand less than aggregate supply. And he saw the revolution or he saw the resolution for this in the abolition of corn laws and the re emergence of capitalists into strength and the growth of the economy. Whereas, Sismondi and such as a socialist as him thought that under consumptionism had nothing to do with something like corn laws or anything else. It was the nature of capitalism. Workers were exploited, they were kept at subsistence or below and they had extremely unhygienic conditions of work, terms of work and so forth. In short, workers had neither the wherewithal to buy enough goods nor did they have the will to seek higher levels of comfort and affluence. They were depressed economically and psychologically. As a result of which, Sismondi believed that Say's law was a myth. Myth created so that people would believe that capitalism was a harmonious process. Sismondi says, it is not a harmonious process at all. Equally important, the glorification of laissez faire was something which Sismondi saw as a trick played to convince people that all was well with the society. Whereas, what was happening was exploitation of workers persisted, continued, increased all the time. But laissez faire as an idea seemed to cover up what was happening to the workers. That is the second. And finally, what was to be done? the society. Sismondi was talking of something which came up again and again in Europe during that century. He said all land must go from the aristocratic landowners into the hands of peasants and small peasant holdings should be the backbone of agriculture. And these small peasants would be the basis of rural economy. And then you would have artisans and workers who would run factories in which they would share the profits. And eventually, the government would become responsible for a very massive social security net, poor laws laws to protect the health of workers, working conditions of workers and so on and so forth. Unemployment, protection. What is interesting about Sismondi's ideas is that they had a vitality which seemed to carry them through the century. Towards the last three decades of the 19th century, there grew up a very powerful movement in Russia in which intellectuals, scientists, thinkers, professors, writers were all involved in an upsurge of fresh thinking about the future of Russia. Broadly, most of them were grouped together under the title Norodniki, 
Narod means people in Russian. Narodniki is people, I mean, people who advocated the rule of people, populists. Narodniki would be people who advocated populism, Narodniks. Now, there were a whole brand, whole variety of uh, um, Narodniks, beginning with people like Chernshevsky, Danielson, Voronsov, and then right to the 1920s, a great economist in Moscow University called Chayanov. They were all of the belief that land must be redistributed to the peasants, taken away from the aristocracy, redistributed to the peasants, that the peasant village or the mayor or the village community or the obscena as they called it also, the village community would become the source of new democracy and new socialism. With its traditional sharing ideas, with its traditional ideas of looking after each other built into a socialist fabric. Russian socialism was seen by these people as the basis of a new Russian society based on obscena or the mir. Now, these people came into violent conflict, not so much violent, but aggressive conflict with the Marxists, who were all earlier Narodniki themselves. They all came from that background. But in the 1890s, Plakhanov and others broke off from the Narodniki movement, started the communist movement in Russia. Incidentally, Danielson was the first person, a Narodnik was the first person who translated Marx, his capital from German into any other language. He translated into Russian. This was the, this was the first non-German publication of capital. So, they were all admirers of Marx, but more emotionally and morally than in terms of a person and than as Marx who analyzed Soviet Union or sorry, analyzed Russian problems. In fact, uh, they were strongly moved by Marx, his analysis of capitalism, his analysis of exploitation and uh, his analysis of the movement of capitalism, all of that. And they were inspired by that to create a framework of resurrection of Russia and they thought Marx would help. I still remember once reading about a woman called Vera Zasulich, a great Narodic leader. She wrote to Marx asking him what should be done with Russia. Show us the way how to make a revolution here. Marx was of course very modest. He wrote back to say that he had no knowledge of what was happening in Russia. It is only Russians who knew what was happening in Russia. So, they should decide what should be done in Russia. If there is any way his ideas had helped them, he was very happy. That was it. But the point I am making is Narodniks were strong followers of Marx in their own way. But Marxists as a party came into existence in the 1890s. And then one of the greatest Marxists, Russian Marxists, a man called Vladimir Ulyanov, but better known as V. I. Lenin. He came into open confrontation with the Narodniki because he saw that the political opposition to the con to the rise of Marxism in, in Russia was the Narodniks, not even the Tsarists. So, there was conflict between them and in 1905, Lenin wrote a classic called Development of Capitalism in Russia, in which, which was entirely a polemic against Narodnik views, which I have just now described the village community the uh, economically strong small peasant farm and so on and so forth. In the 1920s, Soviet Union had come into being, but still there were Norodnik thinkers in Moscow University. One professor Chayanov, a great agricultural economist, wrote a classic called Peasant Farm Organization, which by the time he published it went underground because very soon he was taken away by Stalin's forces and he was lost somewhere in Siberia. But his peasant farm organization was resurrected by the American Economic Association in the 1960s and published as a classic. Now, what China was saying was precisely what people like Sismondi were saying, what Chernshevsky and Danielson and all these Warrensov they were saying that 
the peasant farm in Russia had its own vitality. It was not a capitalist organization, it was not exploitative. It had its own vitality, it had a tremendous strength to survive and grow. And at the same time, it was more suited to Russian conditions, conditions than capitalist agriculture and so on and so forth. Well, that is the story of the Narodniks. I just brought it up, so that uh, it will be a nice aside to see how far Sismondi like ideas went in the 19th century, almost right through the century. Godwin, William Godwin was a libertarian, he was conservative, but he was a strong utilitarian also. He looks at property from a utilitarian point of view and thinks that is unjustifiable because property does not carry any meaning. I must explain that other British socialists had criticized property not from a utilitarian point of view, but from a, from a natural rights point of view. We will come to that. These were followers of Ricardo, but who used Locke's idea of state of nature and who had their own idea of natural rights. We will come to that, but at this point in time it is William Godwin and Godwin simply said that property was not justified simply because it was good not good from a utilitarian point of view. There was no way you could justify property from that point of view. And he had, although Ricardo was not a utilitarian, Ricardo was another person who thought in the same way, which is the reason he felt that the future of England was better in the hands of capitalists than with landowners. So, Godwin's central program was that if property was abolished, then all the evils of capitalism would be removed and people would be able to live an equalitarian existence. But then abolition of the state is as important as abolition of property, because it is the state which upheld the property rights. The legitimacy of property came because the state authorized private property. So, according to Godwin, the state should be abolished just as property should be abolished. So, you can see that William Godwin was a fine anarchist in his own way. A person who says states should be abolished is none other than an anarchist. But one of the most interesting Englishmen of that period was Robert Owen. Scotsman, an industrialist, he strongly believed in communitarian and socialistic ideas. He believed that people were neither good nor bad, but they were creatures who were conditioned by the circumstances environments in which they lived. So, his whole idea was that if you create institutions of sharing, institutions of collective management, institutions of communal living. They, then if you have children growing up in that, these children would be the ch children constituting a new generation, a socialistic generation. So, towards this end, Owen converted his factory into a socialistic cooperative, which was run and managed by the workers and which was run and which was also a profit sharing entity. And his idea was that a socialistic or communal type of existence would be encouraged around that factory. Some kind of commune would be organized where the workers and their families would live and thereby gradually educate themselves into socialistic ideas. And all activities which are of exchange between his organization and the rest of the world would be on the basis of equal labor, which was simply that he was using labor as a numeraire. He was a strong believer in labor theory of value. What is a numeraire? Anybody? Aditi? When I gather from the context, I think it is probably uh, 
the value of a good would be decided by nice guess but but do you know numerator otherwise oh you didn't study general equilibrium you have yeah you have we haven't finished general equilibrium we did but we didn't come across numerator what is money in a general equilibrium model there is no money it's an exchange exchange economy right but the money is notional no yeah so what was the function it was a numerator namely it was only an accounting entity which measured the value of goods was just a measure otherwise it had no existence that kind of money is a numerator so here labor was used as a numerator in robert owen's thinking everything would be measured in terms of the the embodied labor and that would in turn lead to a new system of exchange based on labor so you have all these english socialist not to forget the ricardian socialist if you remember many of ricardian people of ricardian times believed in locke's idea of natural right particularly the right to property was a natural right because locke said each man was entitled to the fruits of his own labor and land property was a creation of his labor and so it was justified and in fact locke went further to say that unequal distribution of land had nothing to do with the fact that some people owned little land and more land in the beginning but the fact was money people came by money and when people made money they invested money in land and that created an, an unnatural ownership of land and therefore inequalities were a product of money rather than landed property according to locke now the ricardian socialist accepted locke's idea of landed property but they said it was not a natural right because landed property always almost always interfered with somebody else's way of expressing his freedom of work what to do with his labor power what to do with the fruits of his labor which was his natural right landed property tended to interfere with other people's natural right of this right so they said landed property was not a natural right and therefore it was not to be encouraged so broadly we have run through a very quick exercise of different genres of socialism as they existed prior to 1850 as i said a lot of them were experimental but most of them were very serious thinkers robert owen for instance was a member of important british government committees which inquired into poverty and uh, his radical opinion came out in his reports which were of course rejected by the british government but what i'm trying to say is a lot of them were very serious people very strong in their belief in what they did and said but what all of them lacked was a clear analysis of capitalism in order to know that you have a disease you have to know, be a good diagnostician in order to be a good diagnostician you have to know your anatomy really well am i not right marx was probably the best one in the knowledge of the anatomy of capitalism so when marx started writing all pre marxian socialists were eclipsed more important marx was not writing something different from what was already said in fact he was quintessentially a classical economist par excellence he carried ricardo's economics to its ultimate logical end as ricardo perhaps himself might not have carried it but then that was not all marx there was a lot of other things to marx too there was an idea of history there's an idea of dialectics and marx was a very strong sociologist too he had an idea of alienation what it did to people so 
by and large putting together the corpus of knowledge starting with labor theory of value and classical political economy building with other things Marx created a system of knowledge which dominated not just the rest of the 19th century, but almost the whole of the 20th century across the world. Break it up for now and start out of the break. <laughs>